text. Thanks for having me down. I appreciate it. Uh, what I was going to uh, talk about tonight, uh, first was just some of our recent research, uh, looking into kind of psychological characteristics that differentiate skeptics of the paranormal versus believers of the paranormal. And then anything else that you guys want to chat about or sort of open it up and say how long you guys want. So, uh, first, just some acknowledgments. I always like to acknowledge you helping me work on the projects. And these are three of my TAs uh, that over the last couple of years have helped collect most of this data that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, this is us actually in Amsterdam, in March, at a conference over there, uh, where we had a lot of fun and presented a lot of data. I'm going to talk about a couple of separate research questions tonight. Uh, and I, wanted, I just kind of separated them out because it's easier to talk about the question versus all the answer, the question versus all the answer, so you can get everybody confused. So, this is our first research question. We wanted to look at kind of what personality variables predicted parable belief. Uh, there was a fair amount of research on this, uh, but the research is really mucky, mucky and kind of murky and contradictory in many cases, and relied on small samples, and so what we wanted to do was take a larger, broader, more uh, homogenous sample in terms of demographics, and be able to look at you know, what sort of big five personality factors are most predictive of believing in ghosts and witches and demons and such. So, in addition to personality, uh, we also measured a number of demographic variables, They've been found throughout the years to be uh, fairly important predictors of paranormal belief, age, gender, things like that. And so basically we want to try to see, okay, what scores or personality factors or the demographic factors related to measures of skepticism? Um, and what we used was we actually used a couple of different measures of skepticism. We'll look at those in a minute. So some of our hypotheses were that a, we could, in combination, use these personality characteristics to predict group membership, skeptic, non-skeptic. Uh, and that three, in particular, would be much higher in the low skepticism. Neuroticism, uh, which you can think of as sort of emotional stability and lack thereof. Extroversion, which is how much I enjoy being outgoing, interacting with groups, versus being kind of uh, to myself. And openness to experience. Uh, and this is a variety of different things, but it's mostly, am I okay with at least uh, thinking about things that I don't already hold to be true? Am I okay with trying new things that I haven't tried before, going new places? Uh, and that's kind of the ultimate. So we predicted that all three of those would be higher in the low skepticism group. While conscientiousness, which is basically how much uh, am I really a good worker? How much do I take seriously the tasks that I've been given? How much do those sort of characteristics, uh, we thought those would be higher in our high skepticism group. So for this we had a total of about 650 participants. Um, this study was uh, college undergraduates uh, at UCO, so it's primarily females. Average age of about 20. Uh, what they did was they went through a recruitment study and then completed a very packet of various online questionnaires. These included uh, what we call the PBSR, which is the Paranormal Belief Scale. It looks at how much do you currently believe in various kinds of paranormal events, and it sort of covers the gamut. It covers traditional religious belief. It covers aliens and sort of uh, extraterrestrial life, it covers witches, it covers cryptids, it covers ghosts, it covers paranormal powers, sort of the whole spectrum of uh, what James Rennie would call woo, right? so the entire spectrum of that. But we also use the big five factors of personality here. Uh, and this is a very commonly used measure called the BFI. And the big five inventory 
has about 60, 65 questions on it to measure these various five factors of personnel. And I'm just talking about we have a lot more measures, but I'm just talking about those, and that's what's directly relevant to this question. So results was first, we took everybody who had taken our sample, and we divided them into high skepticism and low skepticism. Um, the low skepticism was more of those people, uh, kind of the 25th percentile of paranormal belief, the 25th the highest. Uh, in the high skepticism group, those people would actually score the lowest on the paranormal. So, so it's a little different from what you would expect. But high skepticism, low PPSR scores. And then what we did was we used uh, a number of statistical techniques to compare those personality traits for high versus low skeptics. Uh, and the model that we made, which I'll show you guys here in a second, uh, actually had a really good success rate. Uh, and so based on what you scored on the Big Five inventory, so what sort of combination of factors you scored on, we were able to predict if you would fall into the higher low group about 66% of the time, which is actually really good, especially for a single measure. Uh, it was a little better for the high skepticism, but overall still pretty high. So here's kind of our means and standard deviations for these big five traits. There's an asterisk at each one that's statistically different. Uh, the only one that wasn't different was agreeableness. And agreeableness is the big five factor where basically uh, how easily able are you to get along with others. So it turns out skeptics and non-skeptics equally able or not able. To get along with other people. Uh, our extroversion scores, although these don't look like huge differences, uh, it turns out they're actually pretty significant. Uh, extroversion, our non skeptics were higher. Conscientiousness, our skeptics were higher. Neuroticism, our non skeptics were higher. Openness, our non skeptics were higher. And so it actually lined right up with what we had predicted, uh, even despite the kind of murkiness of the previous research. So, in other words, our skeptics were less outgoing, uh, more conscientious, less neurotic, so more emotionally stable, uh, and less open to new experience than the non-skeptics were. Which is kind of an interesting thing. So when you think about the sort of typical portrayal of skeptics, whether it's by detractors or by your friends that aren't skeptical, comes to them, you know, like, oh, you just, you're closed-minded. Well, you actually, it turns out we are a little more closed-minded uh, than the, the believers, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing <laughs> when you're talking about things like ghosts and uh, UFOs. You know, we have closed minds, but not so closed. We won't accept evidence that actually says what this, go, what this is. Um, our non-skeptics were more neurotic, uh, so less emotionally stable. Um, so it's interesting, and we'll follow that up here in a minute. Um, but the non skeptics also are a little more outgoing. Not a ton, but certainly a little bit more outgoing than the skeptics. Which kind of fits with, I don't know if any, how many of you have been to a, like a big skeptics convention or something. Okay, yeah. There's a lot of social awkwardness that often happens. <laughs> There's lots of like, I don't know. Skepticism, their lack of belief in the paranormal. 
Well, some of our other research will say, eh, maybe not. We think there's some underlying cognitive things that's going on there. Um, but certainly, personality, which you get up and about, differs quite a bit between skeptics and non skeptics, which is pretty interesting. Our second research question still came directly from that first research. Because the neuroticism was so much higher in our believers of the paranormal. And so I had just, kind of by happenstance, happened to put a, as part of a research questionnaire, uh, a mental health questionnaire in there as well, to look at overall mental health. And so we thought, turns out neuroticism and mental health are very highly related. The less emotionally stable you are, what? The more likely you are to have mental health problems. And so we thought, okay, well, let's look at that. Let's look at what the relationship is between paranormal belief and mental health thing. Uh, and the research on this is very sparse and extremely conflicting. Overall, the bulk of the literature tends to suggest uh, a negative relationship between certain aspects of mental health and paranormal belief. Um, meaning that as your parental health goes up, your mental health tends to go down. But only things that have really been looked at uh, sorry, were schizophrenia. And that was really what it was. Um, and this makes a lot of sense, particularly from the evolutionary point of view, from some of our current models and understanding schizophrenia, where you have these delusions, which are very, very bizarre beliefs with no actual evidence for them, hallucinations, persecutory ideals. Um, and a lot of people who have those sort of things have very outside-the-norm experiences, which would probably make you more likely to believe in their own sort of phenomenon. Um, if you're seeing things that other people can't see constantly, hearing things other people can't hear. Uh, one lady that I worked with in the past, uh, she had a very strong belief that angels were in the town that she lived. They were sending her messages through their intermediate. So you could meet at things like uh, the grocery store, just to happen upon them. So she had very strong paranormal beliefs. But there hasn't really been much of anything looking at overall belief and overall mental health. And so what we did was we looked at general mental health, not just schizophrenia, which is what most things like this. Religiosity, which it turns out is uh, fairly important variable for some reason, we'll talk about in a minute and reported experience of paranormal events. Right. So, our hypotheses were that lower levels of mental health would be associated with an increased report of paranormal experiences. Because it turns out when you look at paranormal belief, you can have belief and then you can have experiences. And just because I have some experiences doesn't necessarily mean that I believe them to be paranormal in nature. I'll give you guys an example. So I, uh, for about the last 30 years, have had hypnopompic and hypnagogic hallucinations combined with sleep paralysis. And so what this means is that I've woken up several times per month, sometimes multiple times per week. I'll wake up, I'll be completely awake, unable to move. My autonomic nervous system will be highly active. My heart will be down his chest, I'll be pouring sweat, and I will see, hear, and feel things around me that are not actually physically there. So uh, I'll see shapes. It's very blurry shapes. I'm not very blind without my glasses, but very blurry shapes in the dark, moving around. Uh, one time this last summer, I woke up to the feeling of a giant snake crawling over my face. Uh, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrible. Uh, I didn't know what the hell this sort of thing was. I thought it was just fairly crazy until I was 19 and I took a general psychology class and they were talking about it and I went, oh, that's what I do. It's not just me. Oh, thank, thank the Lord. You know, it's not, it's not just this weird, crazy thing that happens to me. It happens to other people as well. Um, but even though I've had those experiences, I don't think they're paranormal in nature. Now, what's interesting is that the vast majority of our folks who think that they've been abducted by aliens had very similar experiences and report a very strong history of sleep paralysis with these hallucinations. Uh, I have them too, but I know they're not aliens. But I can certainly empathize with people who think they are because they're terrifying. 
And then you just sort of drop back into sleep. There's your missing time. You wake up, you're like, ah, I got probed. Something happened. <laughs> <laughs> Which maybe it was just a bad party. <laughs> well, I can certainly empathize with that. And so, just having a paranormal experience doesn't mean that you necessarily believe it. So we can actually measure belief in the paranormal and the level of paranormal experiences. So here we were looking at paranormal experiences, primarily. So same participants. Um, measures were somewhat similar in that we had something called the AEI, which is the Anomalous Experience Inventory. This is a measure of odd events that you might experience. Uh, psychic events, uh, drug and alcohol related hallucinations and illusions. I think you saw a ghost, all sorts of kind of odd paranormal events. Uh, but this isn't just, I believe, that ghosts are real. This is, oh, I've actually seen it. Uh, but we also included and looked at the parallel belief scale again, and just looking at the level of parallel belief, because the two can be independent. Uh, for mental health, we use what's called the behavioral health screening measure. And this is just a broad instrument, fairly quick, about 20 questions, um, that asks about all sorts of different aspects of mental health. So it asks about psychotic experiences, but also asks about eating disorders, depression, OCD, anxiety, drug and alcohol problems, sort of the full range. What this is intended to use is, as the name would suggest, a screening measure. If you score high on this, maybe you should seek some help. Uh, and since this was originally developed on an undergrad population, that's why the system we had an undergrad population we were working with. Uh, and it's very good at detecting who does and doesn't have actual health problems. Um, the specificity that's really high, so very few false positives. Uh, we also here looked at religious belief. Uh, we use this thing called the Santa Clara Strength and Religious Faith Questionnaire. What the Santa Clara does is it measures not just do I believe in a God or not, but to what level do you believe in God. So it's not just a dichotomous yes, no, atheist, non-theist, uh, you know, versus a theist. It instead measures the level. Because I can perhaps identify as religious, but have a much lower level someone else who identifies out as the same religion. So this gives us more of a continuous variable to look at it, rather than just a yes, no, theist, atheist. Uh, so again, we got a lot of questionnaire data uh, that we divided into low skepticism versus high skepticism, which gave us a total of uh, 322 cases. And the first thing we saw was that there was a very significant relationship between paranormal experiences, so have I had a paranormal experience, and self-reported religiosity. The anomalous experiences inventory doesn't ask about sort of traditional religious experiences. It asks about things that are not that well, not like God spoke to me when I was praying, or I felt the presence when I was in church. These are very far outside of that. I know somebody's been a alien. I've seen an alien before. I've seen a ghost before. I've experience psychic phenomena, those sort of things. Um, fairly strong relationship there. Uh, age and sex, not related at all to paranormal experiences, uh, which is different when you get older. A lot of the older research, or the research on folks who are older, um, so community samples seem to find that uh, biological sex is fairly predictive with females having higher levels of parallel belief and higher number, numbers of reported anomalous experiences. But that wasn't the case in our center. So the first thing we did was we wanted to look at the different aspects of the anomalous ex events experience and see what those aspects are in a minute using a, a stats technique called multiple hierarch hierarchical regression. And what we were trying to predict was what we call uh, the BHS M score, the mental health score. So we're trying to see what aspects of anomalous events are most likely to predict your mental health. Um, so which type of experience? It's not just overall, because overall there was a strong relationship. But we want to see which specifically. I apologize, 
because it's very small, it's a lot of data that's in all of points. <coughs> uh, how regression works is through putting variables in and seeing how predictive, how strong the related is the variable x to criterion y. And so what you do is you can enter in a whole bunch of different variables and see which ones are the most predictive. Uh, and so what we did first was we put religiosity in because there's a really strong relationship between religiosity and paranormal events. Uh, so we sort of, to control for that influence, put it in first. Uh, it only accounted for about 3% of the variance in mental health. So in other words, not a whole lot, uh, not a ton of variance there. Our next step, though, was the uh, paranormal experiences subscale uh, of the anomalous experiences in it. And it was a huge predictor, it turned out. Um, predicting by itself over 22% of the variance in mental health scores. So in other words, if you thought that you had been contacted by a deceased loved one, if you thought you'd been contacted by an alien, if you thought you'd seen a Bigfoot, then you were fairly likely to have overall mental health problems. Um, step three was what we call the paranormal ability subscale. This is not just I experienced, but I think I have it. So I think I have paranormal abilities. Um, and it had just a tiny amount, but still a significant amount. Use of drug and alcohol, which we thought would actually be very high <laughs> in terms of the predictor, um, added, again, predicted a small amount of variance, um, but not a huge amount that you would expect for having, you know, using a lot of drugs and alcohol. Uh, and then fear of the paranormal, again, very tiny amounts of change. And so our overall model, mostly being driven by the paranormal experiences, uh, predicted about 26% of the variance in your uh, mental health score. Now in social science research, that's actually a fairly huge number. Um, because what we've got here is we've got basically one subscale that's driving this research, uh, that's driving this change. And it's pretty bad. Oh. <laughs> paranormal experiences. Cable, it's not going to call it. That's what it is. Test your thoughts. But, no magic. So, what we wanted to use then was we wanted to see okay, will your mental health actually be able to predict if you fall into a high skeptics or a low skeptics? So in other words, we looked at your anomalous experiences and saw those were predictive. But can we kind of reverse this and look at mental health predicting skepticism, particularly predicting your scores in the parent belief? So not just have I experienced it, but do my parental beliefs sort of derive perhaps from that mental health problem? Uh, and the relationship between these was quite significant. We use uh, a technique called logistic regression for this because the kinds of variables involved. It was very, very significant. Um, with our ability to predict which group you fell in based on your mental health score at about 63%, which is pretty huge, uh, particularly in social, social science research. Um, so this means that I can, you know, you guys are a little too homogenous in the group. So if we go out on campus and I start handing out flyers and make people fill out questionnaires, I can score their mental health questionnaire and be able to predict about 63.5% of the time whether or not they're a high skeptic or a low skeptic. Um, and if they're scoring higher, it turns out they're low skeptic, um, which is good news for all of us here. <laughs> You're like, yes, I knew, I knew I was okay. <laughs> they kept telling me I wasn't, good luck. Look, I got data now showing that statistically there's a good chance I'm okay. Um, of course, there's outliers, but uh, but that's okay. So fairly fairly good success there. So overall, what we found then from the second research question was 
that increased paranormal experiences, belief that you have paranormal ability, and fear of that uh, reliably predicted mental health problems, even when you controlled for religiosity. And that we can predict about 27% of the variance in mental health just based on your anomalous experiences. Uh, and furthermore, we can predict fairly reliably based on your mental health scores whether you are skeptical. And so this is pretty interesting because honestly there's not tons and tons of work in this area because it's been uh, a little taboo. Uh, people were kind of a little, a little afraid to look into it because of a lot of the, I would say, kind of negative language uh, that's often thrown about from non-believers towards believers. Uh, Dawkins' book being probably the most well-known example, The God Delusion. And he's using delusion in a very different way than we in the clinical realm use the term delusion. Um, and you hear things like, oh, well, people who believe in God or ghosts or whatever, like they're, they're crazy. That's what it is. They're crazy. It's like, well, no. Uh, but it turns out they may have more paranormal or more mental health problems than the average skeptic, which is kind of interesting. So that's kind of all I have.